Hi everyone, it's Pastor Brenda. Really glad to meet you here in this space. So we're gonna be continuing on this Lead Your Brain series with this wonderful thought that God has wired us for change. How we are created is wired for change. Think about that for a moment. So let me begin with some scriptures about how we are able to lead our brain and why this is scripturally true. 2 Corinthians 10.5 teaches us that we destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. You may know this verse more from the NIV where it says, we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We take captive every thought. Do you understand? We have the ability to lead our brain. Otherwise, we can't take thoughts captive. Philippians 4.8, you may know this verse. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Philippians 4.8 makes zero sense unless we have this ability, this God-given authority to lead our brain. Because this means we have the power over what we think, as Philippians 4.8 encourages us to do. So let me just do a quick review of the brain again. Um, we have this prefrontal cortex lobe that does our, our executive thinking, the high intensity stuff, the complex thinking. And this part of our brain needs a lot of battery power. This is why if you've done some big test exam or some big project and your brain just hurts, that's because it does. And this battery does need to be recharged, which is why we do need to have regular sleep. And so when I say sleep is a spiritual practice, I mean it. It's one of the easiest ones you can do. You need to have a regular practice of sleeping, regular set hours and a regular schedule as best, best as you can to recharge your brain so then you can lead your brain. When you're leading your brain, you find out how your brain then is wired to change. Now the rest of the brain that runs our patterns, that takes hardly any energy, any stuff. Our heartbeat, it works all the time and takes very, very little energy. And when we're resting our brain, the heartbeat keeps going without any hardly energy ex exerted over that. Eventually, when we make these big decisions with our prefrontal cortex lobe, these big decisions will be moved into the back of our brain, into the patterns. And what now is so hard to change a habit, and you're just in this rut, and you can't, you just, it takes so much, because it's exhausting to make a change in your life, right? It's, it's, it takes time to make change in your life. It takes some failure to make this change in your life because you are creating new neural pathways to make this change. But eventually it is going to come into the pattern part of your brain and soon that, that habit will be just, you know, the habit you're trying to overcome will be in the past. This habit you're trying to create will be just something you do day in, day out with hardly any energy exerted. This is how our brain works. So, first question of the night. God has wired us for change. And we have this big, beautiful, plastic brain. So when I say that, what hope do you feel when you hear that God has wired us for change? What hope do you feel that God has wired us for change? Hit pause, have this conversation, I'll be waiting right here. See, I'm still here. How was that conversation? It, I mean, some amazing, awe-inspiring thoughts, right? Now, the science behind the work called emotional agility found, this is a quote, traditional self-help tends to see change in terms of lofty goals and total transformation. But research actually supports the opposite view that small deliberate tweaks infused with your values can make a huge difference in your life. This is especially true when we tweak the routine and habitual parts of life 
which through daily repetition then afford tremendous leverage for change. And that's Susan David, Emotional Agility, page 13. Book you can read. I mean, bring up some stuff here. Instead of having that lofty view, that powering over, it's January 1st. I'm going to change my life this year. I'm going to set these 10 goals to be done in the beginning of the year. These lofty goals and then you know what happens, right? But what science is finding, it's actually in these small, deliberate tweaks matched with our values when change actually happens. So, if my brain doesn't sync with the truth that I am a child of God, that my identity is in Christ, I decide I'm going to make some small, deliberate tweaks to start believing that. I'm going to trust God when I'm a mix of fear and faith. I'm going to trust God just a bit more than I trust everything else, that I trust everybody else is speaking into my life, or I trust the regurgitation of my brain. I'm going to just make these small, deliberate tweaks to trust just a little bit more and see if I can match up to the truth about who I am. I choose intense, long-term contemplation about God so that my brain can permanently change. So our faith can give us power for change, but so does our God-given neurobiology. Science call this neuroplasticity. This is this big, beautiful plastic brain that we have. Our brains are malleable, and as our neurons and synapses rewire, we change. New neurons can even form. And this happens a lot when you're growing and you're a child, you're in school and you get tired a lot because you're in school, your neurons, you're just making these neural pathways all the time. This happens all the way to the end of life. It just gets a little bit slower when we get older. You know that saying, you can't teach old dogs new tricks? Yeah, that's true because it just slows down for us older folks, but you still are able to change. You're still, your brain is still plastic enough for change. So any repeated brain activity rewires us. And once rewired, our mental and physical experience of the world can be changed. Once again, we have the ability to lead our brains. And we have this God-given authority. Now this change, this rewiring of our brain, this can be used for good and for bad. It could lead to addiction or it could lead to recovery. It can make us quick to anger or to spill over with gratitude. We can become more empathetic or more susceptible to temptation. Where the changes can make us more or less like Jesus. Change goes both ways, right? So any habit or activity can be rewired over time as long as it is repeated over time. You have regular exercise, and you, some of you, you know this, the more you regularly exercise, the sooner it becomes a pattern. And it goes into the pattern part of your brain, and you just exercise. It's not the battle of your brain to overcome, to get up and do it. It's become a pattern in your life. Same thing with inactivity. You got the good and the bad, right? You got this pattern of exercise and you got two days of inactivity and you got three days of inactivity and all of a sudden this is your neural pathway and you back to the front part of your brain exhausting yourself to make that change again. So the same thing, disciplines like prayer, meditation or gratitude journaling, all small, repetitive, deliberate tweaks that's going to create positive neural pathways for your brain. Or we can also rewire badly through bursts of anger, fits of frustration, or holding grudges. Even our patterns of thought and belief impact specific pathways of our neurons. Yes, our beliefs can actually change the biology of our brain. So say you have this small view of God, one who's always angry with you, your brain is going to make neural pathways that says that this is true. Again, the brain doesn't know the difference, right? 
And all of a sudden, your neural pathways are repeating that you have this small view of God, and your brain is stuck like that. So, for example, I was um, pastoral counseling a lady last week. I'm going through a lot. And she sent me a, a meme that her former church sent her, and she read it, and she read how this church was shaming her. I read the meme, and I went, first of all, it's bad grammar. Second of all, I think I know what they're saying, but if they would have had better grammar or better sentence structure, it would have read much easier, and I would understand it much better. But nowhere in there did it read a calling out shame in this person's life. But because this person's overcoming a lot of abuse, to her, her neural pathways read it, and it read shame. And she just, she was just so hurt. Her church would send this out to shame her. And it was not true. Do you see how we can lead our brains? We have this God-given authority and we are wired to change. We can change this regurgitation that our brain is in and actually start seeing the truth and mostly seeing the truth of who God says that we are. So, some other signs. Neuroplasticity is not the only force at work in our brains. There's some other things we need to talk about here. Is we, we have, do have genetic traits that are part of our brains. Science has found that trauma can be passed down up to four generations. This is, this is disheartening because if your grandmother had a lot of trauma in her life, it is going to affect you. They can actually find that trauma in your genes. It's, it's a new science. It's very fascinating. But you may be struggling with something, and then you heard, learn that your grandmother struggled with something, and you're like, huh? I didn't never met my grandmother. But it, it does transmit through our genes to the third and fourth generation. So you may know this verse out of the Old Testament, one of the laws. I'm going to read it to you. It's Numbers 14, 18. The Lord is slow to anger and filled with unfailing love, forgiving every kind of sin and rebellion. But he does not ex excuse the guilty. He lays the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations. We have science, new science, confirming something written in the law in the book of Numbers. It's true. It's an amazing thought, but I also want you to hear two things. If you come from a trauma background and you got generations of it, I want you to hear this truth. You're still wired for change. That is the way it is. God has given you this big, beautiful plastic brain and you are wired to change and you can. You can be the generation that breaks the previous generation stuff and pass on your genes to your children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. All right. And then again, notice how this verse opens up. It says, the Lord is slow to anger and filled with unfailing love, forgiving every kind of sin and rebellion. This is our larger story, God. This combination of slow to anger and unfailing love or actually Hesed love, look up that word on the internet, is fascinating. It's found five times in the Bible. And here it is yet again, this combination, talking about sins of previous generations affecting you, trauma of previous generations affecting you, where God is still for you, slow to anger, and full of this Hesed loyal unfailing love that we don't even have an English word for, for you. This is true. Um, something else we got to talk about, there are psychiatric conditions and neurochemical imbalances that can fight against our most earnest efforts for change. This is true. Um, and we just have to acknowledge it that change is still available. Slow to anger, this unfailing love is still available to you. But there is just, it's just going to be a little extra hard. 
just want to say over on our website, we have a resources section called the other 167 hours. And if, if you scroll down, you'll see there's a link to a blog post. Um, if this, this is just one example, if you know somebody or you struggle with OCD, I mean, not, not the catch all phrase we use to make fun of people who like things clean, but people who really have OCD and they've been diagnosed with this disorder and it's not funny and it's not fun. Um, there's a blog I've included on there for you to read of, of this lady who is learning how to view God through her OCD. And of course, through her OCD, she sees God as judgmental of her all the time. And she's learning to undo this thinking and she's writing it down for us. And it is amazing because she's seeing how she's OCD and it's very complicated, but she can lead her brain and she's coming to understand of this big, beautiful, larger story God in her life. So that's a resource for you found on our church website. Um, because again, it's a little bit harder if you got one of these chemical imbalances, but there's still hope for you to lead your brain because God has wired us for change. And this is the hope. Um, if we make these small deliberate tweaks as I choose to give God more credibility than everything, everyone else. And this is why we're called larger story at this church, because the story is larger than our situation in this moment. We can change our narrow pathways and our brains are plastic enough to do this. So I'm going to ask this question and this is, this is a big one for you people to talk about because here comes the practicality of how we can change these neural pathways, how we can change generational sins, how we can make these habits stick in our lives. You ready? What small deliberate tweaks have worked for you? Share that story with each other and see if you can get about 10 different ideas from each other of some tweaks you can try to start making this change. Just hit pause. I'll be right here. All right. Do you have, do you see, see the possibility that change is possible for you? And did you get some good ideas from each other of how things that you can try to make these small deliberate tweaks? So I just want to leave you with two things uh, um, in closing here. One is we're going to do one more, one more series in this because there's a whole thing about how the character of God teaches us to have values and how these values that match the character of God actually help us change our brains, help rewire our brains. So up until now, you can look at this and go, do I need Jesus? Do I, do I need to depend on a savior? Because I can just rewire my brain. But God has given us these brains and he's given us these beautiful plastic brains. But the more we are like Jesus, the more our neurobiology changes. So that's coming up. Then I want to give you this visual that one of our people, when we meet for church on Friday nights, gave us in our conversation that you guys just had with your people. So did you see the movie Twister? It's an older movie, so maybe you have, maybe you haven't. But if you have, you'll, you'll see this scene. It's at the end. The Twisters are coming, and they're in a truck trying to get away from the Twister, but they're in a ditch and they're driving down the ditch and they just can't get out of the ditch, can't get out of the ditch. But the twister's coming, the twister's coming and finally they get to get out of the ditch. Then they go back in the ditch. Then they get out of the ditch. They get out of the, and this is a good picture of how your brain is rewiring. You are more than your brain believes. Your soul designed by God. And part of this design is this beautiful neuroplasticity of your brain, which can change your habits and how you think. So may you this week be in awe about this wonderful, beautiful plastic brain that God has given you. And may you do these small deliberate tweaks day in and day out. And may you find change in your life. I pray this for you in the name of Jesus. Amen. And I'll see you later.